I'm absolutely delighted we now have a Labour budget and it was just that, a Labour budget. It's a really fundamental um, political deception that's going on here. Now you can say it's a very Labour budget, but it's not what they said they do. So if you look at the overall tax burden, we're now above the G7 average, but we are lower still than France and Germany and Scandinavia. Is, is that, that the sense. real trend that we're starting to see in this budget, Jonathan, that we're actually heading towards European levels of the state? The government will not want to come back and make more big uh, tax increases. Philosophically, if you like, coming from the IEA, if you look, look think back to the, the mini budgets and, and all the sort of disastrous outcomes, do, do you ever sort of wonder if you're on the wrong side of the <laughs> argument there? <laughs>and welcome to the political forecast. After months of speculation, leaks and endless criticism, we finally have it. The first Labour budget in 14 years, the first ever by a woman. £70 billion more spending, £40 billion more tax, a lot more borrowing and a lot more debt. Does it define this Labour government? Will it deliver growth and fix public services? Is it what people voted for? I'm joined by KPMG's chief economist, Yel Selfin. Jonathan Ashworth is chief executive of Keir Starmer's favoured think tank, Labour Together, and Matthew Lesh of the Institute of Economic Affairs, the think tank perhaps most closely associated with the last prime minister to go for growth, Liz Truss. Jonathan, these are huge numbers, £70 billion of extra spending, £40 billion of extra tax rises. And although you might have stuck to Labour's definition of its pre-election promises on no rises to national insurance. You have put up employers' national insurance and all the experts and the OBR say that will filter through most of it to employees. So, so does this work as a big picture good news budget for Labour? Well, I mean, forgive me a quick indulgence at the start. This is my first time talking about a Labour budget. I've spent 14 years coming on your evening news program or podcast to talk about conservative budgets. So I'm absolutely delighted we now have a Labour budget. And it was just that, a Labour budget. Significant investment in the National Health Service, something I was always very passionate about as a member of parliament. A pay rise for low paid workers, investment in our crumbling schools. It was a budget which was ambitious on investment. And in terms of your, your very specific point about the national insurance increase, it, one of my tests for this budget is whether it would do the work of stabilising the public finances. This government inherited broken public finances. That means it did have to take some tough decisions. And one of those tough decisions was this national insurance increase on in, uh, for, for employers. But actually, of course, in many ways, it's reversing the recent decreases. So I think it's a fair budget in that respect. I mean, so, so you're delighted, but it is a very traditional Labour budget, isn't it? It's what, it's what your opponents warned before the election. They'll tax you more, they'll spend more, they'll borrow more, no, no, no. and they'll spend it on the health service, which well, is exactly what you've done. Well, 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 I mean, it depends what Labour traditions you're pointing to. If you're pointing to the traditions of the last Labour government that brought down, that delivered the, ha the highest satisfaction ratings in the NHS and the lowest waiting list, then that is a tradition that I'm proud to associate myself with. However, we did not increase direct taxation on people's income tax or their, uh, of their, the, the national insurance they pay on their wages. And of course, we didn't increase VAT, which were the, which were the big tax promises that we made in our manifesto. But, but in terms of the honesty around it, you know, the, the pre-election, you know, we all, we all, everyone kind of knew this would happen. And so well, that was the tenor of all uh, the, all the interviewing. Uh, yeah. And every Labour, in, you know, politician would say, no, you know, these are our tax pledges. We're not planning to raise well, tax beyond VAT and, and the non-DOMs. Um, and, and every poll said, voters don't really believe this. You know, Paul Johnson was out there saying, this is not true. This is, you know, this, they're not going to be able to do this. And sure enough, you've not been able to yep. stick to those pledges well, but, uh, by and large. I mean, and, I, and now we've got £40 billion pounds worth of, of tax rises. I mean, I, I, mean, I sat, sat literally in this chair in the studio uh, having discussions with you in the general election campaign and, and uh, would have made m m many of those points. Uh, now, the good people of Leicester South relieved me of the burden <laughs> of going into government. However, uh, my friends who were fortunate enough to make it to government have been genuinely shocked at what the previous government left behind. 
big spending commitments which were never scored in the public finances. This government has been genuinely shocked at the promises that were made on the never-never, if you like, by the previous government, and they feel they've had to clear up that mess. Matthew, I mean, it is striking that these are very big numbers, um, but as you can see in the markets, everyone's relaxed about it. Just because it's expected doesn't mean that it's not significant. And I think that we really have to get to the heart of what is a really fundamental um, political deception that's going on here. Not only on the question of national insurance, employers' national insurance. Now, I don't think any, you can play around with semantics as much as you like, but what we're talking about here is an, an average um, employer having to pay £900 extra per an employee. And the OBR have come out themselves and said that's going to drag down people's incomes, that's going to drag down consumption, it's going to hurt economic growth. And that's, that's blatantly obvious. But the other part of this, and this is beyond even any Anything in the in the you know the oh there's a bit of a fiscal black hole that claim that they're making, which is that prior to the election, Rachel Reeves was quite clear that she accepted the existing spending settlements and that she also accepted existing fiscal rules. They're now completely reverse track on that. Now you can say it's a very Labour budget, but it's not what they said they do. Um, it's it's not what they claim their purpose would be in government. And and I think I also disagree about this point about oh it's not you know everything is completely reasonable with these new fiscal rules. We've got to get a lot of additional borrowing here. I mean the, the decisions the OBR have said is 170 billion pounds of additional spending over, over the estimates. Now, that's a massive expansion the size of the state, a record tax take. That There's a lot going on here that, that ultimately is um, going to be economically damaging. These are decisions the government's more than welcome to make. They want to obviously pay off public sector workers with higher wages. I hope, beyond all hope, that the NHS gets better, although we, we have to see the reform plans and the risk is if you just keep spending more money on the NHS without actually fixing um, the, the, the systems and the structures, you're not really going to get anywhere other than higher wages. Um, and then the, this broader question of how are we getting that growth. We're not seeing this promise of the highest growth in the G7 when you've got 1.5% growth at the end of the decade. That's the real problem, isn't it, Jonathan, with, with the sort of the big picture, which is that you, you, you look at, you know, a big amount of spending, big amount of taxing and borrowing, and the growth just isn't that impressive. It's not that different from what the growth projections were under the last government, albeit with the black hole, which I know you talk about. No, 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 sure. And I think the, the, the question is, do we get, do the in investments that are being made in infrastructure and the National Health Service drive growth for the long term? It was very interesting that Rachel Reeves was talking about a longer horizon for growth projections for the, from the OBR. I think if I was uh, one of my, uh, you know, back in the cabinet with my former colleagues and I was still there, I, I would be delighted. I mean, everybody will say, you know, why can't this be fixed and that be fixed? That's, a, that's not quite the question. It's whether the projects are shovel ready, whether they can go immediately. So, so is it, I mean, have they got the time scale wrong? What we're seeing in terms of sort of the money is big splurge in the short term, and that produces a bit of a short term growth uptick. And then it, it all kind of goes back to how things were. Given the challenge is, well, how do you spend money immediately if it's tomorrow available? Have they got have they got it the wrong way around? Well, I think there is a bit of a challenge here. So, so Paul Johnson from, from the IFS just made the point that you're looking at 64 billion in additional spending next year. Now, can, can you effectively spend that money in a way that's going to increase public sector productivity? Is going to not only get shovels in the ground, but get the, the shovels in the in the ground in the right places, and that are actually going to going to grow the economy and, and deal with with our lackluster quality of our infrastructure? What, what about what Jonathan's saying about you know the, the the, the labour nature of this budget, though, which is which he's delighted about. I mean, do you get do you get that? Do you get that message loud and clear? I, I mean, absolutely. I think it's interesting to, to think about who who are Labour's kind of new constituencies in many many centres. And a yeah, lot does of, this tell you what this government's yeah, about? I mean, it, it does tell me something quite fundamental, which is this government does care a lot about public sector workers, about its unionised workforce. It wants to see them get pay rises. That's why it's taking money out of the private sector and putting it in the public sector. That that that's a, a completely legitimate, I suppose, political choice. And that's that's kind of what, in some sense, is what you'd expect from a Labour government because uh, that's their voters and that's their supporters. And you would expect a higher level of, of spending and, and perhaps associated public debt. But they're also saying that they're a government for growth and, and that we're going we're gonna to get the, these big growth dividends and, and they're not necessarily um, consistent um, commitments. But the, 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 the one point I would just add to, to caution my uh, friend here who from, the, from a centre-right perspective, who comes at this from a centre-right perspective is, it is false to assume that it is just traditional Labour supporters who want to see more investment in the NHS. At the think tank that I now run, Labour Together, we've done a big piece of work analysing the recent general election. And what was clear is that 
Tory voters switching to Labour, one of their driving factors was the state of the NHS. And uh, so I, I'm in favour of the, the National Health Service. I'm uh, I'm a Labour politician. Of course, I want to see investment of the NHS. I want to see it reformed. I want to see it improved. But Tory voters who switch to Labour also want to see the NHS improved. And that's why in that respect, that was quite, a, that was quite an astute budget from Rachel Reeves today. And, and so do you think that becomes the most important thing? You know, that you've got, you've got to see visible delivery well, in the NHS in five years, otherwise you don't get 10 years. My oh. hunch will be in 2028, 2029, the state of the NHS and whether Labour has been able to make significant improvements on the NHS and bring down the waiting lists and, and make it easier to see a GP and all the all the questions and issues that we know we've, we've been rehearsed a hundred times in studios. If Labour can be seen to make progress on that, I think that's very significant for them at the next election. I mean, Gail, from your point of view, has this crystallised what this government's about? Well, I, I think generally when, when you think about day-to-day -day spending, especially for the unprotected departments, spending is going to go down in real terms. We're not really going to see a major increase overall when you look at the five-year horizon, which means that the Chancellor is putting a lot of faith in the increase in productivity and efficiency and putting technology in. There's quite a lot to deliver on that. And I think... NHS is very important, delivering on the NHS is very important, but also on the investment side and delivering growth on the back of it will be very tough. So the spending on the NHS has now gone from the size of the Ukrainian economy to the size of the Nigerian economy, um, it's somewhere some 260 million people. Um, the Tories also put, you're worth saying, put tens of billions more into the NHS. So I think the, the important point here is, is not just going to be on inputs, but it needs to be on outcomes and whether or not all this spending will work. And indeed, I think Labour will get rewarded um, if, they, if their programme for reform of the NHS is successful. But if with, with money alone, you're not, you're not necessarily going to achieve that. The risk is that it's then not enough, you know, in your terms, isn't it? Because what you've done is taken it back, as you say, to sort of historical increases. But the, the transformation that is required in the NHS now is, is much greater than that sort of historical trend. So, you know, the, the risk is still that you won't actually deliver on expectation. You won't have enough money, mm -hmm. definitely, because you would need to increase spending to in line with the rise in, in GDP, et cetera, we're no way near that. So you will need to be quite tough in terms of restructuring, in terms of really working much more wisely to deliver outcomes than what you have so far. You can't always use that, that um, theme of, well, we just need more money because you won't have that. Well, well okay. it's, I mean, it's worth pointing out here that um, for, since before, COVID, um, tens of billions more a year is going to the NHS. Um, and but the problem is the productivity one, which is the number of actual operations didn't really go up. I think you probably actually need some more radical reforms than, than what Labor's doing and, and perhaps looking to some of the quite successful social insurance systems that do deliver better value for money um, it, right across um, the European continent or perhaps something more similar to Australia. Whatever your reform is, it needs to be kind of more structural and fundamental rather than what seems to happen at the moment, which is putting more money into it, would obviously have some positive impact. But I think you're right, with the pressures on the NHS, it's not necessarily going to achieve everything we want it to. Well, I mean, I, I would argue in the NHS there's a few things that needs to be done. First of all, I mean, we, it can make better use of technology. There is no question of, about that. The NHS still relies on fax machines and, and pagers. I mean, I mean, I, I, when I first got to Westminster 20 odd years ago, we all had pagers. When was the last time you used a pager as a journalist? I mean, the NHS still relies on pagers and fax machines. The IT infrastructure can be transformed. The other thing that was obviously widely expected was capital gains mm -hmm. rates going up and they've gone up yeah. perhaps a bit less than people might have feared. Exactly. Um, that, that, that is the, that's the reaction, is it going to be? Is it going to be actually a sigh of relief? I think it is generally the reaction, but, but ultimately what you need to think about is that if you want growth to accelerate, you need to be a little bit careful as to how much you penalize business and investors. I think that is really the crucial thing. You want to protect workers, but you also want to bring in the capital and you do want to incentivize companies to stay and to grow. 
So it's a balancing act for, for the Chancellor here. I mean, there's a real risk, not that necessarily any one of these individual measures has a significant impact, but the signal that that sends by putting up capital gains tax, getting rid of non-DOM status, changing around the rules for private equity, making um, less exemptions for inheritance tax, all these things together are, are basically saying to wealthy people that Britain is not a particularly welcome place for you and that perhaps you should take your money um, and your investment uh, and your life elsewhere in the world. And there is concern and there, there are some findings that Britain is losing um, the most millionaires for anywhere except for China over the expected over the coming years. Um, th this, I think, should be a concern for the government. If you try and squeeze too much at the top, um, it does end up damaging your economy. You, you don't want to scare away the people who have, have the most potential money to bring to, into the economy. I just wanted to put it into context. If you look at the overall tax burden, we are now above the G7 average, but we are lower still than France and Germany and Scandinavia. But our level of services is potentially not as high as some of these economies. So I think there's still a little bit of room there, but we're getting not not where we want to. On is that, that the sense. real trend that we're starting to see in this budget, Jonathan, that we're actually heading towards European levels of the state, you know, and, and the tax take? and that we are going to converge now with the rest of Europe. Well, I, I, I'd be foolish to predict the future. I, I think the government will not want to come back and make more big uh, tax increases. I think they they are hoping that this is the only time that they, they need to introduce a, a tax, tax rises on anywhere near this scale. I mean, you know, you cannot predict the future. You can never, obviously no chancellor could, would rule anything in or anything out. They've, you know, that would not be responsible, but they don't want to have to do a budget like this again. I think they will think they've done the difficult stuff at the start of this parliament and for the rest of the parliament, they want to focus on introducing the reforms, whether that's reforms to planning to make sure this extra investment in infrastructure uh, uh, delivers and works for them, introduce the internal reforms to the National Health Service, uh, and so on. So uh, the commitments on personal taxation uh, will be kept for the rest of the parliament because that's a manifesto commitment. So I don't think we're heading for the more Scandinavian levels of taxation. Okay. But this is definitely a government, it feels, that schools and hospitals have been neglected. And this was a schools and hospitals first budget. And if you think about the political management of this, the government's taken a lot of stick yeah. for uh, sort of early announcing the winter fuel payment pain. Mm. And, you know, and having faced months of criticism uh, from millions of people or having alienated millions of people for not very much money. Does that seem a bit cleverer now that, that that's not, because that would have been the story of this budget, wouldn't it? If, if they'd have announced it today, we wouldn't be talking about any of this. We'd be talking about the hit on pensioners. Uh, well, well, I dare say we'd be talking about all of it. Um, um, look, I mean, they took a decision on the winter fuel payment and look, I was around in the Treasury uh, with Gordon Brown back in the day. The winter fuel payment was introduced at a time when the pension did not ratchet up year after year by either earnings, inflation or 2.5%, what we call the triple lock. In them days, the pension only went up in line with inflation. And because it was a period of very low inflation, you got these situations where the pension only went up by 75 pence, very controversial at the time, which is why Gordon Brown introduced this additional top-up payment in, in the winter, the winter fuel payment. In a period where you have the have this triple lock ratchet in the value of the state pension, that you don't necessarily need the winter fuel payment. That was the argument for that. However, it's never easy to take money off people, particularly in the cold months. But what I mean is, as a piece of political management, it's taken a lot. Of, it's taken a beating. Do you think it was that? It's now looking perhaps a bit smarter than some well, people uh, thought. Well, I mean, I think I think more generally, there's been a lot. There's been a lot of sort of doom and gloom, and people thinking the worst and thinking that all kinds of terrible things were going to happen in this budget. I mean, there was a lot of speculation that pensions tax relief was going to be looked at. I mean, you know, mm. yeah. things like that. That has been there's been a lot of gnashing of teeth on the money pages of the newspapers on that. So. So actually, uh, uh, I think people were so worried about some aspects of the budget that they do feel a little and, bit relieved today. And that's come through, Matthew, in a lot of the surveys. You know, the people are people are depressed and you know feeling very gloomy about the state of the economy. I suppose they might feel a bit better now that they realise a lot of the stuff they were fearing hasn't happened. I think when Labour came to government, there was this genuine sense of hope for the future, aspiration. You saw Keir Starmer's ratings go up, but it did seem like and the former chief economist at the Bank of England made this point that all that talking down of the economy saying we have to make these tough decisions had a, had a real kind of mood impact 
um, on people's willingness to perhaps hire, on, on economic growth in, in the short so run. So do you expect that to improve now? Well, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure, but, but I hope so. I mean, I hope, I hope this is a reversal, but it's not, it's not necessarily that good news. If, if you look at, let's say you're an, an employer today, not only do you have an average of 900 pounds extra for each employee um, the, the, because of the NI increase, you also have higher minimum wages, you have um, new employment regulations coming down the track. These, these are all gonna impose significant costs on you. Um, but perhaps uh, we can hope and, and really should hope for the planning reform um, for improvement in public services and productivity that, that might um, pro provide some counter pressure. But it doesn't seem bit, you're in a fantastic situation after this budget in terms of hope. And I think the risk for Keir Starmer politically is that damage is already done, that it's very hard to recover in terms of your personal approval ratings at this point, and that very quickly things will, will get even more more negative, particularly as, as we come into winter and the, the national mood inevitably, I think, always turns a bit downwards. And f philosophically, if you like, coming from the IEA, if you look, look think back to the, the mini budgets and, and all the sort of disastrous outcomes um, of, of that in the immediate days after uh, that budget. And you, you contrast this with sort of what, you know, they've clearly gone for sort of very, very stable, um, you know, uh, intentions, if you like. And that's, you know, th that, that's what the forecasts suggest. Um, do, do you ever sort of wonder if you're, sort of, if, you know, if you, if you're on, if you're on the wrong side of the <laughs> argument there? You I know. mean, look, I, I don't think, I think that the problem with the um, mini budget ultimately that it wasn't particularly fiscally responsible. It wasn't a real budget. They didn't deal with cutting spending in order to cut taxes. They also, you know, the single biggest measure in it was the increasing energy price cap. So it was trying to borrow too much right at the time the, the gilt markets were um, really taking a turn. And then you add on top of that what happened, the pension funds with the gilts the week after and the, the Bank of England intervention, then withdrawal of the intervention. It's, it's a whole story into itself. And I don't think the fundamental idea of trying to grow the economy, of trying to keep taxes low is, is a bad one. Um, even if the, the mini budget in, in, for its own kind of idiosyncratic reasons was um, not a success. Was there an alternative budget in your mind today of what they should have done? Well, I mean, I, I would have probably not um, gone ahead with uh, as much of the spending that, that they've done. And you wouldn't need to do the tax increases to pay for that. You wouldn't need to borrow as much um, if, if you don't take that position of, of really ramping up public sector spending. Um, it, most of the, the other, uh, so there's two other things you can do here, of course. One is to deal with issues in the tax system, actually reform the tax system in ways that get economic growth going. So deal with things like um, council tax and business rates and stamp duty that are disastrous taxes, try to simplify the way the tax system works, which ultimately grow the economy. And then secondarily to that, which is um, not really a fiscal matter, but more on, again, on fixing things like fixing the planning system, reforming the NHS, that they're ultimately going to deliver the growth that then let you put up spending down the track. There's one other thing I want to throw in there, which is um, Labour politicians are always a little bit coy about this because um, it's not something Labour politicians feel comfortable talking about, although I was always comfortable talking about it. Welfare reform. I mean, the Chancellor today did say she's going to press ahead with some significant changes, reforms to something called the Work Capability Assessment. She's going to look at how we deal with this huge numbers of people who have been flowing on to sickness and incapa incapacity benefits, which, you know, the state, that, that, that is a break on economic growth at the moment. I think, I think that's very interesting. It's something that I, uh, it was one of my policy uh, uh, preoccupations. I want to see welfare reform. I think you can change the system. There's going to be a white paper coming out very soon. I, I think that's a very, very uh, intriguing reform agenda, and I think it's one to watch, actually. And it, and it can get very politically bumpy. And it, it can get very politically bumpy, Because you'll be yes. accused of attacking the most vulnerable people uh, and forcing uh, them back to work. Yeah, it can get very uh, bumpy very, very quickly, but the system at the moment is broken, and there are people who want to work but who are essentially trapped on uh, uh, benefits because the system does not support them to get, return to work. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure one of the big criticisms of this budget as, as the days unfold is going to be, it was a contradiction because they say they want growth, but they've put all these costs on business, uh, you know, as, as, as Matthew is sort of um, uh, as, as de describing. I mean, do you think there will be a negative impact on investment, which is what the Chancellor says she wants, as a result of her tax measures that will affect growth? Well, I think one of the things we need to bear in mind to start with is that we do not live in isolation. Yeah. So whether people invest here versus other places will depend also of what the climate is elsewhere. And that is really important to, to think about in, in that context. So I think 
just looking at the budget as it is today, it promised more certainty, which is very important. She's she's going to give us a much longer horizon of where the plans are. And, and that is really important for businesses. And I think the Chancellor heard the message very clear. I think also the what what we hear from our client is that the government is in a much more listening mode to businesses and trying to understand what will help unlock um, growth. Um, so all that is important. Whether the burden increases on the tax side, in some ways it's less important. It is crucial for certain sectors. For example, if I, if I think about hospitality sector, we've got that combination of increase in the minimum wage or living wage as well of that increase, significant increase on employer national uh, insurance contribution. So it is really mixed in that sense. And Matthew, I mean, has this given your, your, your side of the aisle, if you like, um, a clear position now as well to oppose from? You know, does it make whoever the new Conservative leader is on Saturday, their, their job a little easier to work out where they should be attacking? Yeah, I think there's been this intriguing political claim in recent years that we're now um, purely exist on a cultural dimension when it comes to our politics, that it's it's that's where people are interested. I think this actually probably does open up an, an economic dividing line. I think it will be relatively easy for the Tories to say, just with, I think, some level of hypocrisy, because, of course, they were overseeing big increases in taxes and spending, but they, they will now turn around and say, well, this is what Labor does, as we heard Rishi Sunak say in his response. They put up taxes, they put up borrowing, and they, they, they put up spending. Now, the challenge the Tories will be to say how they're not going to do that and what their alternative plans are um, and they're going to have to develop that in opposition and, and this this is in a sense what the same challenge for Labour was in opposition as well. So do you, you actually see this as, as uh, a continuation of the orthodoxy? I think it's it's a, it's a step up, but it's it's no significant difference in trajectory to what the Tories were doing. So so the Tories are looking at the highest taxes since 1948. It's now the highest taxes since the 1940s ever on record. Uh, it's it's a difference, it, but it's a difference not in um, direction. It's, just, it's a difference in, in overall quantity. It, it's in many ways, putting up national insurance was something Rishi Sunak wanted to do in 2021. In, in, in fact, I think it was the shadow health secretary at the time who said that was unfair, which um, you might remember who that was. Um, <laughs> it, it is it's something that uh, the, the Tories were on the way to, to tax increases as well. So it's a, we've got to be honest here um, about what the Tories, and I think they need to be honest as well, which is um, if they're not going to just do the same thing again in government, what is their alternative plan? And Jonathan, I mean, this was the budget that had to define this government. Mm. I mean, do you think it's, you know, put them back on a slightly more even keel um, from from a government that's been sort of not really enjoying life very much the last few weeks? Uh, I think it's definitely given a sense of purpose to this government. And it's clear what the government's priorities are. It's investment. It is fixing the National Health Service. And of course, the challenge will come for Conservatives, and it is miserable in opposition. It really is. I was there for 14 years, and uh, you know, you think you've had a good day if you manage to get a, on a sort of, you know, a good interview on Channel 4 News one evening, and uh, <laughs> you get a good run out in the House of Commons that day. I mean, it's pretty compared to being in government. It's it's tough stuff. But of course, whoever wins the Conservative leadership contest, if they criticise any of this investment, they will immediately be asked, "Well, what would you cut? What investment do you not want to go ahead?" In the same way. You used to ask us as Labour politicians when we would come on and complain that there wasn't enough investment, you'd say, what tax would go up? I mean, it was it, it's it's the mirror image of that. So, And Tory politicians will be expect, expected to explain uh, what their alternative would be. But for Labour, do you think this puts Labour on a better footing now? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think it will give uh, 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 Labour politicians, it'll put a spring in their step and they will know that they have got a they have got a set of policies that they can go back to their constituents and talk to them about and say they're delivering on. Thank you all very much indeed. That's it for this edition of the Political Forecast. For now, bye bye.